Then the second graph didn't really put him on this. <laughs> And then actually measure them. 
That's a bit of a bit of a lack in a, a review process, and uh, it's very serious. Well, with my <coughs> students and colleagues, I've been doing a little bit of research on these things that I've mentioned up above, and um, I sort of feel in a little bit embarrassed. It's all about Tasmania, and Tasmania's a bit different to Western Australia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like I went to a reserve um, this morning, which had some clay pans and some and some uh, beautiful short short forest of eucalyptus colophylla, and um, had 500 native plant species in it. <laughs> and you can see from outside side of this this little patch, there was a there was a railway line and a freeway. And the other side of the patch, there were really hideous houses with totally inappropriate plants that didn't match the setting whatsoever. Uh, on the other side of the, the thing, and that was trapped between them with 500 species, most of them in flower. And there were even some bandicoot diggings there, which I was pleased to see. But um, I didn't see any sign of wallabies or kangaroos, which is unfortunate. Um, so, so. It is very different because 500 species would be more than the total flora of Mount Wellington and Hobart where I live and that goes from sea level to the alpine zone. Yeah, yeah, and this little, little area has got 500 species in it. And a lot of them are totally weird I have to say as well. I mean, <laughs> evolution's taken a pretty gross turn in Western Australia and <laughs> the plant kingdom. <laughs> There's great difficulties in actually identifying What's, what genera or genus or a family, a lot of things are in when you come from the eastern states. It's absolutely wonderful. So, you know, like I, I agree with the previous speaker that so the, even a very weak application of the precautionary principle, uh, it would lead to the cessation of any further clearing of anything, actually, in, in Australia. We cleared all the good land except for little bits and pieces that have been left by accident. And those little bit, bits and pieces that have been left by accident in places like the wheat belt and, um, and the coastal plains in Western Australia and in the Midlands and the basalt country of uh, Tasmania are precious because they're the only places we've got the original ecosystems left in these little fragments in the stuff in the good land. So we should be looking after the good land. Are we looking after the good land? Well, flying over the wheat sheep belt and uh, coming over here to give this talk and adding to the carbon burn of the planet, um, I, I saw some really, really, really bad landscapes. I mean, they're so bad, they're almost good. Um, you know, like good examples of what you shouldn't do with a landscape <laughs> in terms of salinization. Um, <clears throat> so we should be concentrating on getting production sustainably out of this, the land that we've got. Now, forests, Australia's strong point hasn't really been forests, if you look at it in the spatial spatial basis, but it's, um, um, our forests are biologically more interesting than most people's forests. <laughs> well, they are. We've got some, you know, some of the most primitive rainforest uh, trees in the world in, in Queensland. We've got Cretaceous, uh, Cretaceous uh, paleoendemics down in the Tasmanian rainforests. We've got an amazingly diverse, restionaceous, proteaceous, epigradaceous, myrtaceous flora in southwestern Western Australia, uh, along with you know, amazing droseras. I mean, who, who invented those? <laughs> Climbing droseras. I mean, wow. Um, so they're pretty good. And of course, the whole of Australia was once a giant rainforest anyway. Um, and um, that's why we've got red soils in the, in the arid zone. It's the, their old, old horizons, of laterite horizons there. And you can see the, the white kaolinite underneath them as well, where it's cut away. So, <clears throat> so this is the research that we've been doing. And I'll just summarise it very briefly. Um, there's most of, the, most of the biological variation in forests is actually stuff that you can't see very well because it hangs out under the ground or it encrusts trees up in the leaves or, or whatever. Uh, there's um, bryophytes. We've done a little bit of work on bryophytes and what we found in the forests of Tasmania and Victoria is that 
there are bryophytes that are just purely associated with particular plant species that tend to be those of um, those in mature forest that hadn't been in primary forest or old growth forest that hadn't been logged for a long time. But in general, they're pretty Catholic in their tastes as they need to be because Australia's always been pretty ratchety apart from in you know, its climate, apart from uh, some of the areas near the Alpine boundary and uh, some of the areas in the Queensland and places like Mount Bartle Freer. So, <clears throat> so the bryophytes, this rich amount of bry bryophytes that you see in this painting here with Jen Steiger in it, this photo with Jen Steiger in it, um, they're dependent on a vascular plant diversity. Um, <clears throat> we've just been doing some work. I had a, had a PhD student, Sapphire McMullen Fisher, who worked on uh, worked on fungi on Mount Wellington, trying to work out what you could use as surrogates for fungal richness. And um, she, we, we went up to a whole series of sites in different environmental, uh, in different environments on Mount Wellington. And I recorded the vascular plants and sapphire and where they were in sapphire. Went back for three, three seasons to collect fungi from those and she got less than 100 species of fungi on the richer site, which is still a pretty good number of fungi, looking at the, um, uh, looking at the above the ground manifestations of the fungi. But we've recently gone back to one of those sites, to that rich site and a couple of the others, and uh, done DNA analysis of fungi in the soil, in the A horizon, B and C horizon, underneath different plant species, and um, yeah, there's 8,000 taxa this is in this is in about three five by five meter plots. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and those tacks are Julie Fielder is uh, is the one that's doing doing this work, and and these these tacks are, are really really closely associated with uh, different vascular plant species as well as being associated with the horizonation in the soil, vary by horizonation, uh, vary by the you're predictable by the by the vascular plant species. So these fungi and other things in the soil are holding it together. They're holding trees together. They connect trees. They feed trees. They basically this when you're looking at a forest, you're seeing trees, but what you're not seeing is infinitely greater than what you do see, and what you don't see um, is reflected in what you do see. <laughs> and I, that was such a wonderful talk about the uh, pathogens of forests, that, and that just illustrated it perfectly, you know, so the sort of disturbance that you get um, where, you, where you lose the, the processes and you're losing the mycorrhizal fungi and, and many others in the process. And, and the processes just start to collapse and the trees collapse and that's a positive feedback. <coughs> so all growth forests and greenhouse gases. Um, <coughs> yes, well, all growth and primary forests have a lot of, a lot of carbon and this is a paper that Christopher Dean, who's the most marvellous scientist, who's a really, really good thinker about how to do science and, and really, really good at, um, at doing it in a very meticulous way. Um, we've been looking, I've been looking with him and Grant over there and with um, Jane Bryan, who was a PhD student of mine as well, and we're looking at stuff in the effects of logging in New Guinea on carbon stocks. And yeah, it was, um, it was interesting because that low impact logging still had a really big reduction in carbon in the tropical rainforest, which, which lasted a while. And, um, and logging old growth forest, you can't, you basically, and this is some of the old growth forest that Chris was working in, uh, and this was some of the conditions that we were measuring things in, because if you're going to measure what, what carbon and there is in an old growth forest, it's very difficult to measure it under trees where we found out a lot of it is, <laughs> unless someone shortened the trees for you. So it's a side, um, side benefit of logging was um, these giant trees were felled and we were able to sample the carbon down the middle of the trees and the centre of the trees and around the edges of the trees and, and excavate them. And 
Also measure, measure the, the heights of the duff, the material that comes down on the base of the tree, uh, and calculate the carbon in those, and also in the root systems of the tree, in the base of the tree. So a lot of this thing was done with multiple photographs and reconstructing 3D models um, to look at this stuff. And here we are cleaning away dirt from the roots of a nothophagus to try and work out how much volume the nothophagus roots have so we can extrapolate that to the rest of the forest, a rather dubious um, extrapolation, but there were no data before, but now there's a data for at least one tree. <laughs> so I encourage people to do this <laughs> before the opportunity disappears when logging stops in native forests and we won't have the chance to do this anymore. <laughs> and work these things out. So, yeah, there's lots of fancy graphs and stuff like that. Um, but the major conclusion that's come from the work that we've, we've done and which Grant's been involved in as well is that um, basically there's a long-term debt from clearing of primary forests, the long-term carbon debt from clearing of primary forests. Because what happens is a primary forest, in most cases, has much more, more biomass above the surface, you know, living things, living things that you take to the laboratory and, and uh, dry them and then weigh them. <laughs> it's a horrible thing to do to living things, but you're supposed to sample them rather than doing the whole tree, otherwise it takes too long. And, um, yeah, there's a huge amount of carbon in primary forests, old-growth forests, and the amount of carbon in the soil is, has a direct relationship. If you look at a lot of data from around the world, the amount of carbon in the soil is directly related to the amount of carbon in the biomass in forests. So the bigger the forest, the more carbon. And there's a, there are slow and fast carbon stores in forest soils. So there are ones that change quite rapidly if you change what happens in the surface of the forest, and there's others that take hundreds and hundreds of years, like in this graph, show, this graph shows you, to change. So if you change a forest from an old growth primary forest, whatever, with large biomass, to one that's a regenerating forest, regenerating, say, in a 40, 90 year cycle, like is planned for a lot of, um, a lot of uh, Australian, Australian forests and is being implemented in a lot of places, then you're always going to ratchet yourself down to a lower level. And that carbon that's in the soil is going to gradually disappear through time. So all the primary forests that have been cleared over the last you know, sort of 600, 700 years, and there's an enormous <coughs> number of them, are still effectively releasing, that clearance is still effectively releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And it's been underestimated in the, in the carbon models. As a side effect of this work, um, and we haven't published this yet, so it hasn't, hasn't been in through, the, through the ratcheting of, um, of, of things. We, we think that there's pro possibly about 7 to 14% extra carbon in the soils of these wet eucalypt forests, these old growth wet eucalypt forests than was previously assumed. That's just from measuring it under the trees where you couldn't measure it before. People hadn't measured it before. So. <clears throat> So, in southwestern Western Australia, we have forests that um, they're sort of rainforests underneath them. I've heard people say that they're not rainforests, but if there's a pot of carpus that grows under these, just because it re-sprouts, we shouldn't disqualify it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of really broad leaf type things, and yeah, it functionally seems to me to be a wet eucalypt forest, and the carbon storage in these forests can be, can be very high. <clears throat> Beautiful things. And yeah, I've got nothing but deep love for the Western Australian forests, but they're certainly having a hard time, aren't they? I mean, with Phytophthora knocking off Jarrahs and, and the Colophilas being, being knocked off near roads and the drought, the, the drought is just, uh, that's taking place in Western Australia is is incredible, the change in climate that's taken place over the last 40 years. But we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't despair because, in my experience, you, we've, we've almost lost one variety of one really famous Tasmanian tree, that's the Cytogum, Eucalyptus gunnii, subspecies Divaricata. And 
almost every stand of that tree has died out. Almost every... T- but the ones that haven't died out, that are still there, um, were the shooters' camps. And they kill the possums. And the possums... The climatic change is making, <laughs> making the possums better able to survive at high altitudes where this tree is. And... Um, so it's the possums and invertebrates are wiping it out, basically, because it tastes pretty yummy, apparently, for if you're an invertebrate or a possum. And if you grow it in Hobart, it just gets wiped out in about two seconds because Hobart's crawling with native animals. And, um, and so, so if, it's an additive pressure that's wiping these things out. There's a whole series of disturbance pressures. There's the ch- climate change. There's logging. There's inappropriate fire regimes. There's a whole lot of things going, and some of those things you can change. So you can actually do something. You don't have to just sit back and despair. You can actually, in most cases, do something, or at least in some cases, do something that's effective in maintaining populations of species that would otherwise go down the drain. I must admit, I was a bit shocked to hear about the, the firing program in the, in, the, in the forests here, that it seems to me like being a Being a cross between a scientist, a social scientist and a policy type person, I'm fully aware of the fact that we don't know, scientists don't know anything because we're just, all we're out to do is to disprove hypotheses. That's our job. We're out there to disprove our own best beliefs. Um, But in doing that, you leave some likely, more likely beliefs and some less likely beliefs behind you. And I, I don't really think we know enough to apply the same fire regime to a huge landscape like this. In fact, I think we know enough to know that we shouldn't. (laughs) Well, I think we heard today enough to know that we shouldn't be applying the same regime. And if you don't know what the right thing to do is, then you just, you do a whole lot of different things. Or you go back to what people that were here for 60,000 years did. Yeah. Yeah. And just have a bit of a think about, and get the people who actually own the land, perhaps, you know, like why to do it um, and in their land. I mean, it's a bit different. We've got foxes, we've got rabbits, we've got other things, but the people in Cape York have modified their fire management regimes to t- take account of the fact that cattle are there and quite like having cattle out of there because they're bigger lumps of meat than the other things that were around. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, yeah, like it's... It's not beyond the bounds of possibility to have a varied fire regime or have one that's been proven. And having a varied fire regime, having a varied anything is a really good idea if you don't know what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, you you don't apply the same regime to everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's been some work in in eastern Australia by a bloke called Zilstra who's worked on fire regimes in the the Alps, uh, in Victoria and New South Wales. And he's looked at the flammability of forests at different ages since fire, and he's found out that the least flammable forests are the older ones because of the change in the structure. And I don't know whether this pertains to any of the, any of the Western Australian forests or not, but it's certainly something that's worth... Because as the forests get older, the, the fuel levels equilibrate in the in the uh, understory, and the structure of the forest changes. It usually you get a, a shrubby layer, and then sometimes that dies and it becomes shorter. So there's a big gap between the fuel and the, and the, the foliage, so, to, so the flames can't leap up into it. So you get less severe fires in older forests than you do in younger ones. And you go over to less flammable grass, not that you're going to have any problems with that. I haven't seen all that many grasses around here. Um, there are a few, though. Um, you get less flammable species as the forests get older. This may not be true here, but we should be finding out. Obviously, if all these animal species depend on having a forest that just hasn't been burnt for 30 years, um, then that's telling us something, isn't it? That's telling us something about what happened in the past. Yeah. So, <coughs> so my message really is... You know, be precautionary in, in managing forests in that you don't do the same thing to everywhere. Minimise additive disturbance. Try and work out the disturbance that you can influence, the ones you can influence, so that you can stop 
the effects of the other ones being too serious. Climate change, all we can do is, is keep as much carbon as possible and there is a mechanism for keeping carbon, allow your forests to grow older, that works. Um, and not clearing old growth forests, that works really well, well as, as well. And it works much better than planting things in dry country because the carbon doesn't accumulate in dry country very fast, it's slow. You, you can't actually measure it after about 20 or 30 years uh, in the semi-arid zone, but in, in wet productive areas you can get accumulation quite quickly. And with threatened species and with all of these things, I say concentrate on the most dependent organisms for the place that you're in. If you're, if the forest you're in's got mainland quokkas in it, um, and, and that they're the most most threatened organism, look after them. Don't worry about western possums. There'll be plenty of them in suburbia. Um, just just concentrate on the things that are most. And because different animals require different fire and disturbance regimes to survive, which is why we exist in doing a sort of research we do. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, that's my message. Um, <clears throat> I totally agree with independent auditors for environmental outcomes, a group of independent auditors, if it could ever be set up, um, because environmental law has been totally corrupted around all of Australia and the destruction of state and planning schemes, local planning schemes, is just the last nail in the coffin. So I, I think we should stop pretending that it's a serious attempt to keep biodiversity <coughs> and ecosystem integrity, integrity in the planet. It's not. It's a smoke screen. It's become a smoke screen. So thank you for listening to me and uh, thank you for being here all the, all the day in this wonderful, wonderful gathering from which I've and thank you to the people who I've listened to who are just marvellous. I just learnt so much from all of you. It's just been great. Yes, OK. So let's have some questions for Professor Kirkpatrick. Yeah, just the, the place you were talking about at the beginning where you saw 500 species, the rough location of where you were looking? It's, it's just a reserve, a clay pan reserve down in the southeast here, about 20 kilometres out. The Brixton Strand. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just one. Yeah, it's a well worth keeping and working on it because the work that's been done there is marvellous and Keeping the, keeping the weed species out of the, out of the clay pans is really, really critically important with the diversity there. Yeah, one incredibly rich. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Laurie. Um, I, I hear what you're saying about uh, uh, if you don't know for sure, you don't necessarily apply the same fire regime over large tracts. Yeah. But wouldn't you say that it's important that that we do something rather than nothing, like... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, you know, even a bad fire regime is better than no fire regime. And when we've seen in the last two years, mm. uh, wildfires taking out 10% uh, uh, of the whole of the, uh, of the Jarrah Forest in the last uh, several years, in, in three or four massive wildfires... Well, the, 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 the controlled burning wasn't much... That is really huge. Okay, it, so, the control so, bench. So where do you find the... I mean, I've got a lot of time for the idea yeah. of listening to the indigenous cultural heritage that we yeah. have. But, but how, how should we be proceeding um, without, without just saying, oh, no, we're, we're not going to... To, to manage fire. Well, what's done in uh, Tasmania and Victoria, and now, though Victoria used to have the same sort of 5% of the forest to be burned every year sort of thing, and they just went out and burnt the Mallee and destroyed, uh, destroyed obligate seed species in the Mallee because that was the easiest thing to burn to get the 5%. Um, it, what happens now is that the burning is, uh, is related to assets, so that if you've got an area that you don't want burnt, so it's a habitat for a quokka, or it's a, a, it's a plantation forest you don't want the fire to come out into, or something like that, then you reduce the fuels in that area, perhaps using, using burning for that. Um, 
so that you basically recognise what you want to keep and organise your fire to keep that rather than applying, applying the same sort of fire regime to the whole landscape. And in the rest of the land, the danger of that is in the rest of the landscape people might be tempted just to have a fire regime or well, just let it happen, but that not, might, mightn't be appropriate either. So there should be, should be variability in the fire regime and the rest of it as well. But at the moment it looks to me as if we've got a great deficit in older understories within the country, within the, within the country and our, our forest country, and we've got, a, we've got an excess of really young stuff. Yeah. So recognizing, by the, recognizing the diversity that's out there and trying to be diverse in the way that we apply. Yes, them. that's right. Because uh, you know, like you'll find, you've, you might, most of the research that's been done in fire has indicated that different fire regimes favour different species, and in some cases can eliminate some. Uh, but in other cases, can you require a particular fire regime for a particular species? And the fact that we've got a diversity of species, the diversity of those sort of responses, means that we've had a diversity of management in the past. Yeah, uh, to allow those species to survive. And uh, our Nunga people are, are, were the ones that were doing it. Yeah, for at least 60,000, 70,000 years. So a lot to learn. we have a lot to learn. Yeah. We are in Tasmania, but I don't know about Western Australia. Someone else will have to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make a quick comment about both of those So in the Jarrah Forest for fire management, think about drought. Drought kills big trees, so it, to use a forestry term, it thins from above. Fire tends to kill smaller trees, so it thins from below. If you think about what drought does, with Jarrah, for example, it, Jarrah, it's strongly affected, it'll, it may re-sprout, but it'll re-sprout down lower. It loses some of its bowl, perhaps. If you burn that stand after it's been drought affected, you may kill those that regrow. And so you have to think about, you know, as Jamie's suggested, this additive disturbance effect. So and we know that certain parts of the forest are more effective than others. So it's, it's, a, it's a texture of information that we can bring to bear on trying to just have a finer grain perspective on how we might use our fire management. In terms of information, um, there are some, there is some information about escape PVs, but um, usually I think they just call them overperforming. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think that information is totally out there. <laughs> Certainly in Tasmania, it's, um, we've had some pretty spectacular escape fires, but including the second largest one in the last 50 years, but it, it, it didn't burn into uh, fire-sensitive communities, so it wasn't good because it had single age in a very large area, but it wasn't, it wasn't a disaster because planned burns tend to be lit in less severe conditions than those lit by arsonists and, and lightning. Yeah. Anyone else? If I could just add to your comment, well, basically, um, truthfully, it was not one country. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not one fire solution. No, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs>